Welcome, and thank you again for coming out on a, a, a Drich day. Uh, I'm John Sheldon, the Executive Director of the George C. Marshall Institute, and I am the moderator for today's events. So with the recent midterm election results, uh, the new Congress has an opportunity to reshape U.S. energy policy in the coming months and years at a time of great political, economic, and geopolitical significance. Uh, here to discuss the implications of the midterm elections for U.S. energy policy, I am delighted to welcome three preeminent experts and commentators in energy policy who have extensive experience in the field. Now, according, uh, if you look at your original program, uh, we were originally going to be joined by Scott Siegel, who's the head of the policy resolution group at Bracewell and Giuliani LLP, uh, but Scott was unexpectedly called to New York on company business, and uh, now his Amtrak is still somewhere between New York and Washington, D.C. However, all is not lost, and uh, we have been joined by the uh, uh, exemplary and eminently adaptable Josh uh, Zives, also of Bracewell and Giuliani. Uh, Josh is senior counsel in Bracewell and Giuliani's uh, policy resolution group uh, with over a decade of experience working on legislative and regulatory advocacy, campaign finance and ethics laws, strategic communication and issues related to energy and international trade. Josh regularly works on a wide range of legislative, regulatory and legal issues connected to energy and environmental issues. He has worked with a variety of companies and trade associations and individuals to craft and execute strategies on matters such, such as regulations under the Clean Air Act, energy exports, and broader climate change policy. Josh joined the PRG team in 2002 after completing a legal, legal education focused on litigation and a graduate education focused on persuasion and argument. Josh has provided expert commentary on matters involving legislation, political law, and international trade to many significant media outlets, including the BBC, I've never heard of them, but uh, there you go, uh, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, and numerous legal and trade publications. In the middle here, we are joined by Mark Mills. Uh, Mark is founder and CEO of the Digital Power Group, an energy and tech capital advisory group. He was formerly the co-founder and chief tech strategist for Digital Power Capital, a boutique venture fund, where, among numerous other transactions, he served as chairman and CEO of a lithium battery startup and earlier co-founded and served as chairman and CTO of ICX Technologies, helping make it public in a 2007 IPO. Mark is a member of the Advisory Council of the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science at, North, at Northwestern University. He is also a member of the Board of Directors at the George C. Marshall Institute and a Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And then last but not least, on my immediate left, we're joined by Mr. Bill O'Keefe, uh, who is CEO of the Marshall Institute and President of Solutions Consulting, Incorporated. He has also served as Senior Vice President of Jelinek, Schwartz and Connolly. I don't think I pronounced the first one correctly there, Bill, but yeah. excuse me. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, he's also was also Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the American Petroleum Institute and Chief Administrative Officer of the Center for Naval Analyses. Mr. O'Keefe has held positions on the Board of Directors of the Kennedy Institute, the U.S. Energy Association, and the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and is Chairman Emeritus of the Global Climate Coalition. So, without further ado, I would like to ask Josh to kick us off with his comments. I thank, thank you for having me here today, and I apologize that, that Scott couldn't be here. This is uh, the dangers of having an earthbound partner uh, who hasn't flown in over 20 years. Uh, so, But I'm happy to be here. I, Scott and I have worked together for almost 13 years on energy environment issues, uh, and have spent a lot of time o over the past few weeks thinking about what these elections would mean. Uh, for the next Congress and for some of the key issues that we work on. Uh, my experience, I, I don't have anywhere near the depth of experience of the, of the other folks here on the, on the panel, particularly on some of the more technical expert issues. I, I'm a lawyer, lobby, lawyer and lobbyist. That, that means my expertise is really on just uh, trying to convince people uh, that there's something that can get done uh, with these Congresses. And over recent years, that has been an increasingly bleak uh, job. Uh, with Congresses that, that have accomplished less and less with, with every passing year. As we look at the recent elections and what they mean for energy environment, uh, generally what we take from it is a, a few things. The, the first is, what can we, everyone is asking us whether we expect things to be different. Have we, does, this, does this move us into a new stage of, of debates over energy environment or even generally? Uh, our take is that Unfortunately, you're likely to see 
more of the same in terms of this Congress uh, rather than the kind of watershed moments that, that a lot of people hope for. Why is that? And many of these points have, have been discussed widely and, and, and are no surprise to anyone. We did have a change, obviously, in control of the Senate. We did not, however, result in a veto-proof majority in the Senate. Uh, we did have an expansion of Republican control in the House, uh, but fundamentally, the House looks about the same uh, as, it, as it did before. You just have slightly larger majorities in the House. You have now a, a decent-sized Republican majority in the Senate, but not the sort of controlling majority that can either get to 60 to break a filibuster with ease or get to 67 to override a veto. Uh, what that means is that large-scale legislation is going to remain a very difficult task for this Congress. Uh, the coalitions are difficult to build on energy and environment issues on both sides, uh, which is why this, it's always easier to defeat legislation uh, in these Congresses than it is to pass it. Uh, that central fact does not change. Uh, if you've got to place money, placing money on beating legislation <coughs> is the good bet. Uh, that hasn't changed. However, what this election did send some strong signals on certain issues. Uh, we represent and do a lot of work on electricity generation issues, which has been a hot button issue uh, since the Obama administration first gave, uh, since President Obama gave his speech at Georgetown declaring his climate initiative uh, two years ago and when, he prom when his EPA promulgated the Clean Power Plan uh, for existing power plants uh, in June. And one message that can be taken from this election is that despite the polling numbers that groups like the environmental activists like to point to that say that the public supports uh, climate change initiatives and is willing to pay more for electricity uh, at, in order to reduce carbon emissions, they aren't delivering votes uh, based upon those polls. Uh, almost an across-the-board loss for climate change activists uh, in this election. Now, some of those races are races they expected to lose, but some of those races represented significant existing losses. Ray Hall's loss in West Virginia is a big loss uh, because it, that race was run almost entirely against Ray Hall on the, on the basis of EPA's regulations. Long-standing member, lost his seat, blamed significantly on that. Also, there were some test cases. Uh, anyone who's familiar with Tom Steyer is, knows that he dumped millions of dollars in, in trying to defeat Republican candidates in a few races. Uh, that money was not money well spent if you, if you measure it by results. Uh, Larry, Larry Lessig, the law school professor who's, raised, who's, who's been very vocal, a very vocal critic of Citizens United and calling for more campaign finance restrictions, his PAC, his counter PAC, uh, dumped a bunch of money into trying to defeat uh, Fred Upton. It failed. There's just It's very difficult to look at this election if you're a sitting member of Congress and, si and, and view this as any sort of threat posed by those calling for more environmental regulation. Uh, what it does is send a strong signal uh, that, and this is no surprise, that if you if the, the side that delivers jobs and that delivers growth goes into these elections with a strong strong advantage. And that message is going to inform this no next Congress on a few key energy and environment issues. First, there is the, while, while I started off by saying that I don't think that this Congress is going to be that much better at passing big legislation, there are legislative functions that do not require passing big legislation in order to be effective. Uh, first, oversight. Uh, the importance of oversight in this Congress is difficult to over, overstate. Uh, it, subpoena power matters. Being able to haul agency officials in front of committees, force them to answer questions on the record, uh, it serves a couple of purposes. First, it constrains administration <coughs> policy when they have to take public positions. Second, it expands the record that, that industry and organizations opposed to regulations are able to use in the course of legal challenges to those regulations. And I can assure you, we are only at the beginning of that stage of process on some of these big regulatory regimes. The Clean Power Plan, for example, is without a doubt the most sweeping EPA proposal 
that's that's been issued in decades, perhaps in the history of the agency, and that it, it uses a less than 300 word provision of the Clean Air Act to give the EPA oversight of virtually every aspect of electricity production, transmission, and use in the states. That is, there is the scope of litigation that's going to be connected to this to these regulations will run for decades. So having oversight authority to haul those officials in time and time again to explain what they've reviewed, what their cost benefit analysis is, how they view the legal basis for these rules, that will matter. And they've been doing it in the House, but the new committees in the Senate bring, will bring a new scrutiny. Why is that? Well, look at the two major committees of jurisdiction on, on environmental issues. First, you've got, the, you've got Senate Environment and Public Works, EPW. There, we're shifting from Senator Boxer to Senator Inhofe. Uh, we've done this game before, where we shifted from Senator Inhofe to Senator Boxer. And I remember speaking to groups like this uh, back when that happened, and we laughed. We couldn't imagine uh, the scope of the transition. Well, now we can imagine what this is going to be like. We've seen this. but. The debate has moved forward, and Senator Inhofe's staff has been working on it this entire time. And I can assure you, they have a lot of questions they're looking forward to being able to ask of the administration at that committee. Uh, not just on what the caricature of Senator Inhofe's positions is, which parts of it he, it's not a caricature, parts he shares, but the, he's expanded the complexity of his critique beyond simply the kind of hoax element that most people are familiar with. To our, his staff has a deep knowledge of the details of these proposals, and there will be a series of hearings at Senate and EPW uh, challenging EPA on those proposals. Similarly, over on the other part of the Senate, at the Senate uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee, uh, we get Chairman Murkowski now. Chairman Murkowski, it, it is difficult to overstate, uh, on, on my growing list of things difficult to overstate. Uh, <laughs> Her knowledge and investment in the details of these issues is stunning. Uh, she has been working, even, even on the minority side, was working at a detail level that is rare for this Congress in terms of trying to find practical coalitions to address real energy and environmental issues. Uh, as chairman, I think there are a lot of exciting possibilities of what that could do. Uh, because she has operated in a way that's built personal relationships and professional relationships across the aisle on her own committee. She, she and her staff are well respected, uh, and I think that committee is, has a list of items that will be interesting for them to work on. While EPW will likely be focused on the oversight issues because of, of Chairman Inhofe, I think ENR, <coughs> you've got some interesting possibilities for actual legislative initiatives. And there I'd put issues like uh, export policy. Uh, Senator Murkowski has been the unquestioned leader on kind of the academic analysis and practical analysis of export policy, both as relates to LNG and as relates to crude oil and uh, products, uh, refined products such as condensate. Uh, whether that's refined or not is a subject of some debate, but she has been right on the forefront and in terms of understanding both the regulatory structure, what can be done ex through executive action, what can be done through legislation, and, what, and how that may benefit or harm various industry sectors. I think we're excited about that debate taking place. It's a, it's a more complex debate than a lot of people, I think, will take, describe it in that industry doesn't all fall in the same place. Uh, in, in, in the export debate. Refiners have a different perspective than producers. Uh, there's, the, there's the likelihood that the debate increases in scope to include issues of importance to refiners like Jones Act changes, which certainly complicate the discussion uh, and are historically difficult to achieve. But if the debate is about artificial in, things that artificially increase costs for domestic <clears throat> for domestic gasoline producers, refiners, and users, it's difficult to not have that discussion. So I think we're looking at a year, year or two of interesting debate and built out and build out of that of that issue. And then there are about and then I think the the other issue, the other tool we'll see used in this Congress is the tool that they have to do, which is funding the government. 
uh, the one piece of legislation that even this Congress knew they had to do eventually uh, is fund the government, whether through appropriation, through norm, regular order and appropriations, or through continuing resolutions uh, or omnibus options. There will be some le funding legislation moving. With control of both houses, uh, issues that can generate 60 votes are likely to find their way into that legislation. Energy and environment issues are going to be one of those issues that they've already been flagged. You know, the constraints on EPA's funding authority for some of these regulatory structures is a likely target of appropriations writers. Uh, and while there's an open debate about whether or not the, the president, whether or not they would be willing to shut down the government over that, over those provisions, it's a different style of the argument because of Republican control of the Senate. It's going to be a more difficult political argument than it was in, in the course of the last shutdown, uh, where th some of those votes didn't even have to be taken because of, uh, of Majority Leader Reid's ability to just simply not take a vote on House legislation that they didn't want, that they didn't like. Even in those debates, I don't think you would necessarily, at least you can't say with certainty that you have the same outcome if you had individual senators having to vote on the various House bills. And then, then it becomes the President's which he never had to do in the course of the whole shutdown, actually veto legislation he opposed. I mean, the, people often forget there were two vetoes. It, it, up to date, the president's vetoed two things. And so placing those bills on his desk, I think, changes the calculus, particularly in the, in, in the circumstances of, of a potential shutdown, if he's having to debate things like regulatory policies that most people have yet to even fully understand. I think the Republican advantage on those is strong. So we, th we see, for the next Congress, a chance for real oversight on energy and environment issues, a chance for some movement forward from ENR on things like LNG and crude exports, at least towards perhaps a more rational policy uh, than we've had right now, which is almost interminable delays on LNG permitting and, and chaos on the, crude ex on the crude issue, quite frankly, because of inconsistent messaging from commerce and industry. And then some real, if there's going to be teeth on the administration on these issues, we think appropriations may be the place to find compromise options that put some teeth in. So that's how we see it. That was great. Uh, let me uh, begin with a, uh, a, you gave me a, a, a great opening to paraphrase something from Winston Churchill. 300 words in the Clean Air Act generate if, uh, decades of uh, argument and legislation. So you could say that uh, never have so few words generated so much work for so many lawyers and lobbyists. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I mean, I have to use that in the column. <laughs> I'll quote you. Uh, Scott. <laughs> So, you know, another, another line I'll use from uh, political history, it's more recent, is the elections have consequences, which gets bandied about a lot now because of uh, the use of, the, of that line by our current president. And we'll, we'll see what kind of consequences it has. And I do uh, generally directionally agree with the timing. I think that's, I don't know that a lot's going to happen quickly. But um, let me, let me uh, do a few remarks at a high level on the premise that reality has consequences, too. And that in the political system, things have to move at a pace that's tolerable to uh, all the players, uh, even, even when there are tectonic shifts in, in, in the world. But what I would outline for you and propose is that we're in the uh, tail end of a tectonic shift in world energy markets. It's essentially identical to, but inverse to, what happened in 1973. We had a six-year period between 1973 and 1979 when the world was turned upside down with respect to people's perceptions of what the reality of energy was, energy being, obvi obvious, to state the obvious, a, a central reality of the survival of all civilizations. It's not a light topic. And in fact, there shouldn't be a Department of Energy, is just a brief aside, because energy is essential to everything. That makes it the Department of Everything. And we, don't, we never found industrial policy work so well. An energy policy has a similar and in, in greater challenge. But that aside, we do, we do engage in energy policies. And we launched the modern era 
of energy policy as it exists today, almost entirely based on the paradigm of a six-year period between 73 and 79, when we, we established a framework for thinking about energy in terms of the United States being the world's largest consumer of energy that was fastest growing in its consumption in an era where the United States was perceived as, as facing a sustained, if not permanent, uh, structure of depletion and dependency, depletion of our resources and dependency on the world for critical energy supplies. That was the framework that was established firmly between 73 and 79. It took years to have legislation created. The Energy Policy and Conservation Act did not emerge in 1974. Other, go other goofier things emerged immediately, like speed limit restrictions by Nixon on the highways. All manner of things happened very quickly, as, as is going on today. But I would propose to you that if you think about what has happened in the last six years again, from roughly 2008 to 2014, the same six-year period, we've had a complete reversal of the paradigm that was extant four and a half decades ago. The United States is no longer the world's fastest growing energy consumer. In fact, all net growth in energy demand essentially occurs outside of the United States. And we are no longer a nation that believes, or should believe, that we are in a state of permanent dependency and depletion of our resources. It is an utter and complete 180 degree reversal of the extant paradigm that established all of the policies that are in place for energy in the United States. I would suggest to you every policy at its root is anchored in the old paradigm. The old paradigm is wrong. And it's changed and it's a secular and permanent shift. When I say permanent, I don't mean for all of eternity, but anything longer than a few decades is permanent in political terms. It's forever. So let me, let me just to paint a picture of how permanent it is and the scale of this to have a, have you just give you a sort of high level ideas. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you sort of examples, high level, five numbers that to have in your head that tell you how big a deal this permanent secular shift is. And, and I'm doing this again because without regard to the details of what can and will happen in, in the legislative arena, I would say my experience over decades in uh, in technology and energy policy is that the paradigms that are in place clearly inform what people believe and what they act on. Even if they are not stated, they may be implicit in what people are believing. And I think a great deal of what's going on now is anchored in implicit beliefs that are unchanged. I have to put it very simplistically, we've gone from an era where we can uh, think about and believe in, that is, some of you may still believe in it, uh, the idea of peak oil. I would suggest we may have been moved into an era of peak subsidies. And that will change things. So five numbers for you to think about. First number is 3,000 billion. Now, the number 3,000 billion I'm using in it to give you a sense of the, the demand scale that the world now faces, which is very different from four or five decades ago. Uh, there's going to be about 3,000 billion more air miles traveled annually in the world in 20 years. There's going to be about 3,000 billion more cooling hours every two weeks in the world 20 years from now. There's going to be about 3,000 billion more megabytes of traffic on the world's networks hourly 20 years from now. These are very big numbers because, and all those numbers involve the consumption of energy, different kinds of energy. One case it's oil. In airplanes it will always be oil. The other case it's electricity. In the electrical world, no matter how optimistic you are about non-hydrocarbons, that is, if you assume peak subsidies are not over and you assume that the IEA gets its wish and three trillion more in subsidies go to non-hydrocarbons over the next two decades, we will still be in a world that is 80 percent supplied by hydrocarbons in the electric sector 20 years from now. So the electric sector is a hydrocarbon sector with demands that are going off scale. And the information sector is, of course, a hidden new source of electric demand that most people are frankly unaware of not to dwell on that, but just to give you a factoid to have in your heads, that between when the last energy transformation occurred in 1973 and today, we didn't have an internet then, self-evidently. We had computers, but we didn't have an internet. We had central and mainframe computers. The world's internet and computing infrastructure today uses as much electricity as the countries of Japan and Germany combined. And it's growing, not shrinking. And in that sector, efficiency increases demand it doesn't decrease it. But for efficiency, there'd be no demand for computing electricity. It's efficiency that drove the, the rise. So that gives you the demand scale. Now I'll do it with another number as a sense of uh, 
2,000 billion is another number to think about. So in the energy world, it's particularly in the oil and gas world, the future of supply in the long run is determined by the geophysical resource, fundamentally. It either exists or it doesn't. So in the United States, the geophysical resource of oil and gas in the shales runs about 2,000 billion barrels. 2,000 billion barrels. So just to, so you understand, if you don't, don't know this, the United States consumes about 20 billion barrels of oil and gas a year. So you don't have to be an arithmetical genius to know that this does not portend an imminent danger of peak supply from a long-run resource perspective. The resource is functionally unlimited. What's unlocked the resource is not the discovery of oil and gas in shales. That's been around for billions of years, and the USGS mapped out those shale fields 100 years ago. It was the advent of new technology. Which will bring me to my next number, the number 350. In the short run, supply of oil and gas are determined not by the geophysical <coughs> resource, but by technology, and only by technology. Technology determines whether or not you can access the resource at a price that's tolerable in a fashion that people can accept. Self-evidently, the oil underneath the North Sea has always existed. It didn't exist for practical purposes until there were deep offshore rigs that could do it. The shale oils only came into practical, practical existence because of the advent of three classes of technology converging. It's not just about hydraulic fracturing. It's about the combination of horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing, and information technologies. And I would suggest to you that it's actually the third that was the catalyst that made the revolution come into play. Small oil and gas producers can now uh, deploy the kind of computing power for finding out where to drill. We don't drill dry holes anymore and how to steer drills horizontally in real time, and now soon how to manage the complex shale fields in real time. It's an information revolution. If the engineers had called it smart drilling, I think you would never have seen signs ban smart drilling. Unfortunately, engineers being what they are, I've worked with lots of them, I worked as one for a while in my career, frack sounded easier to say when you're doing a job after you've figured out where to go into the sweet spot of a shale field. So what has happened in that technology, that what, where the number 350 comes in, is this. Technology always gets better, everywhere and all the time, for all things. So the idea that the shale game is over because we've tapped it out means that you have to believe a priori that technology has stopped getting better. I'll give you a fact related to 350. In the last four years, the efficacy of oil and gas rigs in the shale fields measured in the way that matters, CapEx per unit of energy out, how many dollars you spend on hardware to get energy out. The CapEx efficiency of shale rigs has improved 350% in four years. 350% improvement in your energy out per unit of dollar in in four years. This is a big deal. That's why there's an oil and gas revolution in America. Just to give you a sense that 350% is the same number as the improvement in the capital efficiency of the energy out of solar arrays as well. That took 15 years to happen. The speed of change in the capital efficiency of solar arrays is running on the asymptote now. It's starting to hit physics limits. It's getting better still, but it's not getting better at the same rate because of physics limits. The speed of the improvement of the efficiency in the shale fields is continuing at the same rate. It will hit physics limits too, but it hasn't hit them yet. The third number I want to have you have in your heads is the number 300 which is more of a, uh, an economic number, and it's a, also a political number. The oil and gas boom in America over the last uh, five or six years has added roughly $300 billion to the U.S. GDP on average each year over the last five years. If that $300 billion had not been added to the GDP from the shale revolution, the United States would have been in a secular depression in every year but one year for the last five years. Not a recession, but a depression. A 2% GDP growth, to test your lunchtime arithmetic, 2% GDP growth on the American economy is about $250 billion of add to the GDP. That's the kind of growth we've been seeing, sub 2%. The oil and gas sector has added $300 billion to the GDP without subsidies, without special favors, without special programs, without any incentives of any particular new kind. If you'd taken it out of the picture, we'd be in a depression. We would have been the second great depression. That fact is certainly not that widely known, but it is certainly known increasingly in places that matter, which incidentally is in political circles. 
If you're in one of the 20 states that's been positively impacted by the shale revolution, which are more than just the states that where the shales are, are being, um, are being uh, manufactured, where the oil is being manufactured in the shales, then you know, you know these facts from the local state data on employment and the, and the uh, monies flowing into the state treasuries and the, and the uh, royalties and revenues are in the ripple out from the entire infrastructure. The next number I'll uh, leave you with, uh, the last number is number three. And this is uh, an important number because it relates to how the world in the geopolitical terms has changed. The future of oil and gas supply on the margin up until six years ago looked like it was going to be dominated by just two players, an oligopoly of Russia and the Middle East. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that was serious that the world demand for oil and gas is rising. It's going to rise by an amount equal to adding two United States worth of demand over the next 25 years. There was also no doubt in anybody's mind until recently that the primary suppliers in the margin to world demand were going to be the Russia and the Middle East, which are not exactly regions of the world that have made it easy in geopolitical terms for the rest of the world to operate. It doesn't matter whether you think in terms of Ukraine or Crimea, Crimea but much more subtle distortions in geopolitics. Well, that's changed. The United States, particular in combination with Canada and Mexico going forward, not only likely will, but can quickly become not just a major third player in the geopolitics of supply of oil and gas on the margin, but has the potential to become the dominant player on the margin. This is a profound tectonic shift in geopolitics. And I would assert that it has already been calibrated into how the Saudis and others in the Middle East and Russians, in particular Putin, thinks about what's going on in the United States. This is not a temporary change, and it's a permanent and, and challenging secular shift. And it's challenging not just because it has net goods for America. It actually has some net negatives because of the disruption it creates in markets. And I don't think most uh, strategists have not really, and by this I mean strategists in the State Department and other similar domains, have not fully calibrated, recalibrated their thinking about geopolitics along those lines. So let, let me, uh, let me uh, wrap up with uh, my policy recommendations for a, co a new Congress, which I don't think you might, my, my wishes and my recommendations, uh, I, I have the luxury of not uh, doing your job of having to actually affect legislation or your job, but, but giving a direction to where I think it might be pr productive to go. Before I give you my, my four my four-point action plan. Everybody has an action plan. I got a four-point action plan. I should, I should make a, a quick observation about non-hydrocarbons, alternative energy. Look, nothing that I just said, the, the, the five numbers, obviates the fact that the world will need lots of non-hydrocarbon energy sources, that there's not going to be a tremendous growth in use of wind, solar, biofuels. That's all going to happen. The world's consumption and needs of fuels is so vast when you understand these scales that it's not possible to supply it all just on the backs of hydrocarbons. And it won't be supplied on the backs of hydrocarbons. But every serious scenario that takes into account economics, by that I mean the, the economic reality of the inertia of systems, sees the world 20 years from now, which is an infinite amount of time in political terms, utterly dominated by hydrocarbons. We cannot overnight replace what amounts to roughly a one to two hundred trillion dollar net present value infrastructure to produce and deliver hydrocarbons. We, the largest single traded commodity in the planet is oil and gas, not food. You don't replace the scale of those things lightly, easily, or overnight, no matter what the aspirational thinkings are, no matter what you think about the reasons to do it. It doesn't matter what the aspirational hopes are. It won't change. The world will be dominated by hydrocarbons, and that's why those other numbers matter. So the four-point action plan is four R's. I mean, you have to do alliterations in policy because it makes it easier to, for politicians to remember them, your bosses, right? So the first R is to uh, ramp up, ramp up production. Look what, what the oil and gas industry has done in six years without help in the face of headwinds. Imagine what would happen if we helped them. What a shock. We could double the three million barrel per day net gain to six. That would be stunning. Why wouldn't we do that? Not to the detriment of other energy policies, but to the benefit of the American political and economic system. The second R would be uh, repeal. And by that I mean repeal what I think are uh, affirmatively goofy restrictions on American companies exporting products that they produce in the United States, which is oil and natural gas. You can't imagine having restrictions on Qualcomm for exporting their, their technology 
without having to first build cell phones here. You can't have, imagine those kind of restrictions on wheat. We can go through a long list of products for which there are no restrictions except standard permitting for operations and building of infrastructure in the United States. The only exceptions typically are weapons systems. So we should repeal those. Now, I realize that it, it won't happen easily, but I think we should repeal them. And I don't think we should fire the bureaucrats in those agencies, by the way. I, I'm a compassionate conservative, to use another political line. We should repurpose the agencies and rename them, just like the Agriculture Department has an Office of Export Assistance. These guys and gals know all about oil and gas. Let's put them to work helping American firms sell oil and gas to the rest of the world. The third R is, um, is to reduce, and this is just to reduce, uh, this is a, a, not a new idea, just to reduce corporate taxes. And the reason I say this in the energy context is because most people don't realize that the oil and gas business is dominated by small and mid-sized enterprises. This is oil and gas revolution in the shale fields did not come from big oil. It was not an Exxon revolution. It was not Hess. It was not the big guys. It was utterly dominated by small and mid-sized enterprises, about 20,000 of them collectively. These are precisely the businesses that get hit hardest by high corporate taxes. They do not have the infrastructure or the capital means or the technical means or the legal means to, and I'll use the unkind word, gain the tax code to get their tax rates down. They pay the highest marginal taxes. Why are we punishing small and mid-sized businesses that generated the kind of wealth that kept the United States out of a depression? Makes no sense. Should repeal, reduce the tax rates. By the way, it's obviously a affirmatively good thing politically and economically even though there's a lot of uh, dis dispute over taxes. The United States was the lowest corporate tax rate regime, as you know, in the developed world until a few years ago. We're now the highest. It's at least as a minimum, we could be average. It would seem that would not be so uh, difficult a goal. The last R, of course, is uh, reform. And this, in my mind, is the most difficult one, which is to reform the Bureau of Land Management somehow. I know that might be even harder than reforming the Jones Act, but let me just put it out there anyway. It was my last point. Look, we had all this boom and growth, this $300 billion plus added to the U.S. economy, roughly 2 million net new jobs. And this is a sector that, is, that has been working only on private and state lands, as all of you know, that the actual production of oil and gas on federal lands has affirmatively declined over the last six years. Declined. And we only, this is on land that by and large is totally unavailable to the private market. It's only 2% of federal land on the contiguous United States is available for leasing. And only, what, I think 6% offshore is available for leasing. Imagine what would happen if we just did two things with BLM, which would shock, I know, and would be, create a firestorm in some communities. But let's say we doubled the amount of land that was available for leasing to a shocking 4% on federal lands and 12% offshore. And then we had the federal regulatory process uh, normalized to what the states do for permitting. So instead of taking 600 plus days to get a permit on federal land, you could get the 30 to 60 days you can get for permits on state lands. Federal lands could match the growth in production that occurred on state lands in exactly the same time frame. There's no reason in the world that can't happen, which would not only double my already doubling, but double it again. That would add 12 million barrels per day of U.S. production capacity, and it could be done in the next six to seven years, because we just did that in the last six to seven years in headwinds. You put those numbers together, and you have uh, revenues and impacts that are unprecedented in U.S. history since roughly 1914. Those are the kinds of tectonic shifts that I think are possible. They're not crazy. They're actually possible because the world's changed. I think those are the forces that will drive the debate that will go forward in the next years. It won't be weeks. I'm, not, I'm, 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 an, I'm, a, I'm an unreformed optimist, but I'm also a realist about what it takes to get things done in this town. But we're working at a, a secular permanent shift in the character of what's going on in our country and in the world. And because of that, I'm very optimistic that we'll see changes as big as occurred between 1973 and 1979 legislatively. And I hope that you all do that. That's your job. I'm going to be, I'll be the cheerleader. One of the problems of being the last speaker is it's hard to think of something that hasn't already been said. Um, and following Mark, I feel like I ought to be quiet for five minutes so you can absorb all the facts and the <laughs> insights. It, it did remind me of drinking water out of a fire hose. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to discussions of energy policy, I, I think of my friend Fred Smith, who founded the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He referred to himself as a despairing optimist. 
and this isn't close enough. Okay. Thank you. Between uh, 1974 and 2007, there were at least seven major energy policy acts. Uh, they were all based on the false premise that um, we had to find total independence, couldn't import anything, that we were running out of oil, and that originally because we were running out, we had to find alternatives, and now we have to find alternatives because of climate change. All of those premises were wrong. Uh, they didn't reflect either energy or economic realities. Uh, so a good place to start would be to try and undo some of the past mistakes and focus on letting markets work and focusing on economic growth and job creation, which investment in energy has done and can do. Uh, I'd like to see um, a change in the ethanol mandate, which in 2007 was premised that gasoline consumption would continue to go up and up and up, and two years later it plateaued, but the mandate is still there. And in the best of all worlds, we get rid of any mandate to use any ethanol, but that's not going to happen um, <clears throat> because everything's going to be looked at through the prism of 2016. The Republicans, having just gained the Senate, will want to keep it, but of the 34 seats that are up in 2016, 24 are Republicans. The Democrats are going to want to regain it, and the Republicans are going to want to gain the White House. So both parties are going to look at policy issues in terms of what does it do in 2016. And um, I hope that Josh is right about no major <laughs> uh, policy actions being taken because if they are, they'll probably be bad. Uh, we need to put an end to the growth in subsidies and the crony capitalism that it has promoted and created, and also bring an end to pouring money into specific outcome technologies. The market can take technology and create what is commercially viable. When the government spends billions of dollars trying to promote wind and solar and 80 mile per gallon cars, it just wastes money and it hooks people on gaming the regulatory system. So I think that we'll see a lot of posturing and the Republicans, I believe, are going to try and demonstrate that they know how to govern. Uh, there'll be a vote tomorrow, I guess it's tomorrow, in the Senate on the Keystone Pipeline. And the president will probably throw Mary Landrieu under the bus and give her a fishing boat for shrimp because he'll veto it on the basis that the process hasn't been completed. The State Department has to complete its review, its review of its prior review of its earlier review. Right. And uh, <laughs> the uh, challenge in Nebraska uh, of uh, the way the decision was made in rooting the pipeline isn't going to be made by their Supreme Court for a couple of weeks, at least a couple of weeks, so the President can say until that's done, it's premature to act. Um, Mark and Josh have mentioned ending the export ban, permitting for LNG facilities. I think it, with our abundance of gas and the need in Western Europe for gas, it's criminal to delay a month or a week because it just pushes out when you could make that available. Other countries will probably develop their capabilities, so where we could have a competitive lead, we'll give that away. Um, Yucca Mountain has been shut down because of Harry Reid, and clearly moving forward on that makes sense. It's a better way to handle nuclear waste. It's probably going to be very difficult to do and probably can't be done in the next uh, 16 months. The renewable portfolio standard is driving up electricity rates um, in every state where they have those because they're forced to use non-conventional electric power. If you look at electricity rates in Europe, they are two to three times what we pay here, and it's because of their 
wrong-headed environmental policies and if the clean coal plant regulation goes through, if the revision to the ozone standard goes through, we'll simply see our rates follow the same way. So I'd like to see a revision or elimination of um, the, the renewable portfolio standards. And maybe there might be a chance to get bipartisan support for the legislation, the Regulatory Transparency Act legislation. Uh, we've got a horrible regulatory system. It's only gotten worse in the last six years. And that might be something that could be agreed to to reduce the cost putting on business and consumers. The, uh, I suspect Lisa Murkowski will push hard for ANWR and OCS, but those are bridges too far. Uh, and I would hope that the Republicans would not waste a lot of energy on things they can't achieve, but try and focus on the things they can do and show that they know how to govern and the actions they take benefit the economy. Someday we're going to expand or increase the number of nuclear power plants we have. They can't, the hundred can't stay operating forever. But so far, we haven't figured a way to lower the cost. And I think the government could look at the actions that it takes or doesn't take that add cost to see whether the private sector could find a way to get the cost of nuclear power plants to be more competitive. Um, Jim Inhofe will probably do everything he can to begin reigning in EPA, and he'll do it with great glee. Uh, that's clearly an agency that is totally out of control, and only Congress can do that either by changing laws, using the Congressional Review Act, or more easily to use the appropriations process to zero out or reduce some line items, and then the President has to decide whether he wants to veto a bill uh, that keeps uh, a certain agency in business. Back in 2001, there were several billion dollars given to the Commerce Department for a climate research program. And I was one of the people at the time that thought that was a good idea. It was a horrible idea. Uh, the bureaucrats captured it, and they've just used it to advance the climate orthodoxy. So zeroing out that money or moving it to universities where it could be spent on basic research on knowledge about the climate system would make more sense. But again, that's, um, that's not going to happen in the next uh, two years. So my guess is the next two years will be a lot of posturing, a lot of rhetoric, and changes around the margin where you can get 60 votes or bipartisan support. John? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel today for uh, uh, Now I uh, would like to open the floor uh, for discussion, so if there are any questions, please identify yourself by raising your hand, and then wait for Helen, uh, who is in the red top there, to come to you with a microphone, and please identify yourself in affiliation before asking your question. So any questions? Over here at the table. And, and please remember, the mic is on, so if it feels like it is, it is on, it's just so the video can record. I'm Mark Carr with Channel Design Group. Um, you mentioned the senator from Alaska a couple of times. I recall her last race where she did a fairly remarkable job on the Republican leadership. Um, is have, have those hatchets been buried, or is she keeping a sharp one behind her back, or what's what's the deal on the politics of that? I think over the last couple of years, uh, Senator Murkowski's working relationship both with, with her conference and, quite frankly, with moderates in the Democratic Party are, as, are very solid. Um, you know, her, her race was a difficult, her, her race was a difficult race. I think, though, that particularly moving forward in this Congress, I think she's looked for, I think people, particularly Republican leadership, are, are looking forward to what she can do on that committee. I, I, don't, I don't view there as being really anything but positive feelings right now with the role she's capable of playing on that committee. Senator McConnell's going to have his hands full with uh, 
Mike Lee and Ted Cruz and any allies they have, the last thing he needs to do <laughs> is to pick a fight with some other senior member of the Senate. So I agree with Josh. Yeah, I've had some personal experience with the senator because, uh, so I'm biased. I sort of hosted a uh, firing line kind of dis discussion with the senator and uh, senator-elect, uh, new newly, newly reelected senator uh, uh, Tim, I uh, call him from uh, South Carolina. And I, I would have to say I'm very impressed with her staff and her, her posture the last couple of years. I know she had, it was, as you say, a tough political mm -hmm. fight. But uh, all the readings that I hear and see through my colleagues and friends are very positive in the Republican caucus, caucus across the board. She's worked very hard, and, and your point is uh, particularly well taken, Josh. Is she's, her, she and her staff are deeply knowledgeable on all the issues that matter. And um, while some would label otherwise, most people would agree that knowledgeable, not reactionary. It's very thoughtful, which is very good. Any other questions? My name is Bob Coakley. I uh, spent 20 years as a Senate staffer and I'm presently sitting on a board on 60 plus. I'd like to raise two points. One, I'd like to say that 60 plus and others in the community have raised the specter of the disproportionate impact of electricity prices on seniors. This is a political hot ball that has the potential of changing the entire dialogue. And certainly to me, and others suggest the death knell of the present EPA coal rule. I invite you all's attention to it. Just plug in webs, uh, the web page at 60 plus. You can see it. It's a growing issue. The second thing I'd like to do is simply reinforce what Bill uh, said about the Congressional Review Act. Uh, the Congressional Review Act is a very particular feature. And to invite your attention to it, this past Monday, Senator Inhofe on uh, radio said that he fully intends to use it and use it aggressively. He's not the only one. Recall this aspect of it, two points about it, and then I would re-invite your thought process here, Bill. Um, whereas it's had a past experience, remember that Senator McCollin, McConnell uh, raised the issue of the CRA with 51 co-sponsors. You only need 30 to get a floor vote without, without the filibuster rule. Uh, but it got held up. He raised it on the issue of the first coal rule. It got held up after a GAO opinion came out and suggested one needed to wait until it was a final rule before the procedures of the CRA would come forward. Um, I was part of the draftsmanship to that act. I can tell you that's a false conclusion. It is not the conclusion that the GAO opinion drew. Let's make it very, very clear that the Congress decided in that act that it would decide what was under the scope of that act, not the executive and when it chose to send something through, or not the courts. And if you introduce resolutions and they get 30 votes, and in this Congress you're going to see it, you can take discrete agency actions and provide oversight, get votes, and take them to, as Bill suggested, the appropriations process where the president would be bound, probably, to have to veto items on appropriation that would have not only a majority of Congress, but a significant number of congressional Democrats. I don't think there's a way in hell, for example, the coal rule would ever survive such a challenge. And there's a whole bunch of other things on the table in that regard. So I'm very optimistic about the ability of the Republican Senate, particularly with this majority leader being the most knowledgeable, together with the environmental chair, um, Senator Inhofe, of how to use the CRA as an as an oversight mechanism. And all of us need to run over to Senator Johnson, who will be the chair of governmental affairs, and say, this is the way. We need to restore a process, a regulatory process that is broken, that fits every single functional area we touch upon. And one way to do it is provide oversight through the CRA. Thank you. Thank you very much for what is obviously a very significant issue. Bill, do you have a response? Well, I guess I'm not as... Uh optimistic as Bob uh, because of the phases that it has to go through. <clears throat> if I recall correctly, the resolution of disapproval has to be approved by both houses. Correct. Then it goes to the president. Correct. If he vetoes it, then you need two-thirds to uh, have it go through. I think it's a helpful education process, but I just wonder on the coal rule whether uh, 
Senator McConnell will get two thirds of the Senate's after the veto to overturn it. I don't, may I respond just real quickly? I don't think that that's necessary if you consider the CRA as an oversight mechanism which is to say you get a majority vote on both houses. Yeah. It's going to be exceedingly different, difficult to, for a president to veto the appropriations writer that will accrue to his next opportunity to sign an appropriations bill. I hope you're right. Uh, I have a question. I'd like to uh, use my position as a moderator and, and abuse it. Um, <laughs> it's a geophysical question, and it uh, relates to something that Mark raised. Uh, Mark, you, you focused on Russia and the Middle East uh, in, in your comments on the geopolitical aspects. Uh, but we had the agreement last week between President Obama and President Xi mm -hmm. on uh, reducing emissions. Um, first of all, I'd like to hear your response on, on that particular agreement, but also what are the implications here for uh, the, uh, the potential energy agenda that uh, this new Congress would like to see happen? It's an interesting agreement. Uh, I mean, asymmetry of the action items required the two parties, which has been adequately covered. So China will, is already burning a billion tons plus coal a year, just a little over a billion, and it's going to burn another half billion at, on top of that by the year 2030. So it's a billion five ton burner under that agreement. So it doesn't really matter what the United States does. Uh, we're, even if the uh, rules that are hostile to coal in the United States cut it in half. It doesn't change the emissions paradigm. It still goes up. Because the U.S. now is an 800 million ton burner, so you take 400 out, you do your math, you're still, we're still going to rise globally. And it also doesn't take into account what's happening in the uh, rest of the ASEAN Tigers. So between, between uh, India in, and Indonesia and Malaysia, if we go through the, the list of countries that are building coal plants or plan to build coal plants, you find another billion tons there. They're not, they're not parties to the agreement, and, and I, I doubt they become parties to the agreement. They might become parties to the agreement under the same terms. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some money, you know, technology. We'll stop burning in 30 years, and, you know, I think those are nice terms if you're on the receiving end of that. So, so I, I don't think it, it changes anything. I think it does, it does ignite the politics of the climate debate, which was the intent. It does give... Uh, uh, some interesting joint venture on new technologies, not for carbon sequestration, but just other things related to energy, which are all good. Uh, all of it intended to improve largely the efficiency of electricity production, which is a really good thing. Uh, it, and it's been a really good thing for, oh, I don't know, 100 years to improve the efficiency of electricity production, which has the effect of increasing electricity consumption globally because it'll make it cheaper for the 2 billion people who don't have any electricity. So they'll, they'll consume earlier than they otherwise would have consumed under a regime where we subsidize more efficient generation technologies available to the world. So the tragedy to commons, so to speak. Josh, do you have a response? Yeah, that, that issue obviously to our clients and, and working on the utility issues and on some of the generation issues has been a, a great deal of interest. Uh, I think that the political point cannot, cannot be emphasized enough on this. In some ways, that the China deal represented re represented a further admission from the, administ the administration of a key point in this debate, which is, and this is what's bedeviled them throughout the climate debate. They cannot win a policy argument if it's unilateral. You cannot, even if you believe every aspect of of, of the climate change literature, you cannot solve any of it. Not one bit of temperature difference. U.S. acting alone. And their own documents that that are have been criticized heavily, but include caveats to this effect. The social cost of carbon report includes a statement that says even if U.S. carbon emissions drop to zero, drop to zero, that the largest cl climate change impacts would be unavoidable because of the global nature of emissions. Uh, throughout the rulemaking process, this is a fact that has left them just twisted around the axle, uh, like the clean power play. And, it, it's the reason why things like the Clean Power Plan get you all costs and no benefits right now. And they're having to point to co-benefits as the only upside. That is, the non the emissions that aren't the subject of the regulation are the only benefits that they can claim from the regulation because of the unilateral nature. So the China deal was announced and quite effectively uh, propagandized uh, because it was attempting to address this core fact. However, no one has made an argument yet that it even substantively addresses that core concern. 
Uh, there is no climate change literature, and again, this is assuming you're living completely in the world of the climate change advocates. There's zero literature that says that 16 more years of increases, then not decreased, but stabilized after 16 more years of increases, would provide would open a window towards avoid, avoiding climate change impacts. None. Zero literature to support that. No one is reporting on that. Right? The, the link between this deal and actually the climate science that supports the reason of entering into the deal. However, 16 more years is a significant amount of time to allow for manufacture, additional manufacturing to relocate to China. Uh, it's a significant amount of time, uh, which, which has been part of our core argument the whole time. If you increase unilaterally, the effect is you drive businesses to where the cost of production is lower and where, by the way, emissions rates are higher. So you have counterproductive environmental benefits and negative economic repercussions. Now you've locked it in for 16 years. And the last point that I would make, and this is, I just, because I don't think people are pointing this out, this is, this is not an inconsequential deal because it does provide China with the ability to tell us to leave them alone for 16 years. If you're concerned about leverage, if China agrees to this deal, how do you go back to them and tell them that now they need to de decrease in that 16 year period? We've cut a deal. That deal is that they'll think about decreasing in 2030. We will decrease further over our current decreases in the interim. We have handed the leverage to the Chinese in this deal. They can criticize our failure to meet our targets, which we will probably <laughs> fail to meet our targets. They will certainly meet their targets for the next 10 years, 16 years, at which point they don't even have to decrease. They just have to say, okay, we're done in increasing. This is a remarkable absence of leverage reflected in this deal. And, and I think as people spend more time in it, they're going to realize that if this is a model for Paris 2015, which really I think is what this really is an attempt to be, is a model where developed countries commit to decrease versus their 2005 numbers. Developing countries commit to decrease at some point in the future, but in the interim just to buy more renewables at the same time that they're also buying coal. Because that's really all the China deal is. We'll cut more, they'll buy more renewables, but also buy build more coal. If that's the model for 2015, I think it will be interesting to see what the environmental community's response to it is, because once they spend some time applying that to their own right. studies, you just there's a total disconnect between the politics and the substance. You mean it's it, another example of the lack of strategic thinking? Uh, <laughs> I'm shocked. If, if you think about what Mark said about China, India, right. Indonesia, uh, the other emerging economies, they're certainly not going to do anything tougher than China. Uh, so we're left with the EU, which is going back <laughs> into a recession. Right. And they seem to be unable to get out, and us. And my guess is somebody's going to introduce a resolution similar to Senate Resolution 98, which advised the president right. not to sign right. a discriminatory a preempt treaty. Preemptive, yeah. 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 And uh, that'll be a shot across the bow, and people who think that they can negotiate a treaty in Paris and bring it back here and get it approved, uh, get the Senate consent, have a long case of amnesia. This is going to be Kyoto all over again because it will damage our economy, it'll drive up electricity rates, and I can just see the campaign of the over 60, low-income, homeless people who are going to be subjected <laughs> So your body's to, homeless? No, to uh, <laughs> increasing electricity rates. Well, and that campaign, so, you know, I mean, that's 60, that campaign, it, that's underway. I mean, it that's, is, yeah. we're, tr yeah. we're trying to explain that to people right now, that the, the, the cost of higher electricity bills is borne entirely by vulnerable populations. Well, you, it's poor, the, the it's average minority, cost it's fixed of, income, right. and it's schools and hospitals who are the largest consumers. But you, the you, average cost of electricity in this country is 12 cents a kilowatt hour, average. The cost in Germany is 32 right. cents. Right. It used so, to be 15 in Germany. Yes. But the, Senator Rakowski actually did, you may all know this, uh, issued a, a uh, study paper uh, in September on exactly this issue, looking at the, uh, how little a change it took in delivered energy costs to homes 
to tip vulnerable, economically vulnerable populations into uh, poverty or into uh, uh, need assistance. And the, you know, the numbers, they were big countries, so the numbers are only millions of people. I mean, it's, but it's, it's millions of people and they'll, they'll be voters, to, you, to your point. It's, May I make a point about that? The Murkowski, remember, Senator Murkowski was the, uh, was the, was the floor leader to the endangerment finding. And this vulnerability of senior citizens and the impact of rising prices on the grid yeah. is a health issue. And sure. that's what's got to come out and become part of the debate. The other thing I'd like to just simply say, Bill, you're absolutely correct, and you should say what the title of that Senate resolution was. Remember, it was Bird Hagel. That would be <laughs> Senator Hagel, right. who is now the Secretary of Defense, right. and who asked the business community not to raise the issue of the 95 to nothing on his confirmation. Those chickens are going to come home to roost. There's another, the one, another the one point thing that uh, could, could. no one has really commented on is this agreement was a great revelation on the part of the president. It explains why he plays golf and not poker. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any more questions? We have several. Okay, Mike at the front here. I remember that. Thank you. Yes, I'm Mike Keynes with the Logistics Management Institute. So my question, I guess, is aimed towards Mark. Uh, I was intrigued by your, your uh, comment that North America could become sort of the leading supply source in mm -hmm. hydrocarbons uh, in, in the near future. So beyond Keystone, I was curious whether among the four R's there are some <laughs> steps that might be taken to facilitate this. I left Keystone out of my uh, four R's because it's, first it's obvious. I mean, Keystone is, is if aside from its uh, its structural impact. I mean, it constitutes less than one percent addition to the net uh, infrastructure of oil pipelines in the North American continent. So it's Canadians. I'm Canadian, so I admit my bias here. Were shocked to their boots, uh, to the skates, more really, over over the opposition to replace Venezuelan oil with Canadian oil. I mean, same same feedstock that was shocking to them. Uh, what I would like to see happen is. Uh, we can now renegotiate NAFTA, the part that got left out of NAFTA, which was the, essentially the energy infrastructure at the, at the request of Pemex, the time when they were still a, an affirmative monopoly. And now I think it's possible to uh, amend NAFTA, basically, to uh, fold in all, the, all features relating to energy trade in North America under a free trade rule, so that you could allow industry to rationalize where pipes should be, rails should go, where refineries should be, because the geography of North America would argue for very different additions to structure than you have when they're impeded by things like State, State Department rules and a whole set of other ancillary challenges that go into any energy business, oil gas business in particular. Uh, it, it, you know, it's really quite remarkable because if you ask, if you do an informal poll and ask people in the energy business, could, could, you, build, could you build a pipeline, could you build a refinery fast enough, not could you with current legislation, current regulations, but just is the economic capability, the energy, the, the industrial infrastructure is there to replicate at times two. Whatever you did in the last six years, could you do twice as much in the next six? Everybody will say, sure, you want double that? We can do double that in our sleep. There's no, there's no physical engineering resource or even capital constraint. The money's there for it. The global money that wants to, to do this, never mind American money, we've had what, 300 billion in foreign direct investment in the last four years in America, in oil and gas fields? A trillion dollars of gross investment in the infrastructure. It, it's this numbers are stunning, and we're we're essentially walking away from that by not grabbing it. It's not a question of just timing. I mean, time value of money is there. It's just by making it clear to industry you shouldn't do it because you'll be keystone. I mean, it's going to uh, maybe it becomes a new verb in the uh, in the <laughs> political English language. Hi, I'm Bob Slaughter. I'm actually. Uh, the um, the first thing, the first legislation I worked on, my first day when I came in as a staffer, was EPCA, and um, so I saw us go through all that, and all of the the discussions of the issue were not very sophisticated at the time. They were all politically right. oriented, but uh, I sit back and I, I listen to what you all have said today and how you've explained this is highly sophisticated 
explanation. <laughs> and, you know, it's a very difficult one to make. And, and we're, these are all very good advocates. But we'll need as many advocates, educated advocates, mm -hmm. as we can get yep. in order to get as much of this yep. through as we can because yep. this window is going to close. Yep. And so, you know, I'm, this is the, the best discussion of these issues that I have ever attended, and I've attended a good many of them. And um, I certainly want to help, and I'm sure everybody else here is going to want to help because uh, the issues are just so important, we can't afford to go through another EPCA exercise. Well, you, can I, one quick political observation of my friends that I work with who, who have to forge legislation. And I've, at, I've given advice to my Republican conservative colleagues on this. This is not, this is not a, an attack, uh, and I don't think, I think Republicans have to be very careful of attacking solar, attacking wind, appear to be. I mean, there are some subsidies which I think are, are excessive. But I, I'm not a fan of saying we're, we should end subsidies to the solar and wind guys overnight. There, maybe ramp down, there's all kinds of, but the real focus has to be what can we do more uh, as opposed to the either or, we have to eliminate uh, the subsidies that are in play for, for, for non-hydrocarbons. Ultimately, though, I think they die a natural death, but if we can get a lot more money in play, we can afford them. So what the hell? We have time for two more questions. So uh, the gentleman uh, uh, with his hand up in the light blue shirt and then the gentleman in the green jacket. Bonner Cohen, National Center for Public Policy Research. Uh, I would be interested in a panel's views, and perhaps Mark Mills would be the best one to address this, on the continuing decline in the global price of oil and how that will affect relatively high-cost producers such as Russia, as well as producers in the Middle East, and for that matter, domestic producers in the United States. Thank you. A short answer, because we don't have a lot of time, but it, it, it obviously low prices are beneficial to lots of, more than they are, more, more good than bad, but obviously uh, it, it, you're much happier as a producer at high prices, fat margins. My, my general thesis is that it's extraordinarily disruptive to the high price producers or the high need takers. Saudis and Russia need the money for, you know, Saudi lifting costs is two to ten dollars. They have huge margins, but they need the hundred dollar barrel, as you all know, for social and, and kleptocracy reasons. What, the real question is, what's the marginal cost for the United States? I would suggest to you that for a lot of the shale fields, number is not what you're reading. It's somewhere, depending on the shale field, between $18 and $40 a barrel. We know for a fact that the Bakken shale boomed, boom started when oil prices were $35 a barrel, then started at $100. And people were making money at $35 in the Bakken. So we know they can make money, and they were drilling fast as they possibly could at $35 to $40. So without knowing if there's any new technology, we already know what their, their floor was. So we, you just put from history, and the floor is lower now because technology's actually made the, made the uh, acquisition cost lower. One more question, the gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, Joe Browder. It's on. OK, Joe Browder from Dunlap and Browder. I just want to say I think your, your observations about what happens to our productivity when Canada, the U.S., and Mexico become more collaborative is, uh, is hugely significant. But how can we expect to achieve the real collaboration with Mexico until we figure out how to resolve our very tangled relationships over Mexican workers in the U.S.? It seems to me that until we solve the Mexican worker in the U.S. issue, we are not going to be in a position to capture all the fruits that we need to for the relationship with Mexico over energy and other economic issues? Mexico's a challenge. Uh, we did, a, we did a, a summit with some Mexican, former Mexican leaders in the Manhattan Institute in New York this past spring after the, 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 the votes in the Mexican Congress. Uh, I, I would take this, I think this would be very difficult, I'm not naive about that, but I think it could actually be an additional stimulant to help resolve some of the other issues, because we're doing something collaborative which will create jobs in both countries. And so I, I guess maybe it seems slightly naive to take this posture, but I think if there was a, a when the three leader summit takes place next year, which it does every year, uh, and I don't think it'll be on the agenda, but if it were on the agenda, it's actually a positive step. We're trying to build more, help Mexico uh, build out its infrastructure, generate the jobs that it needs. Right now we're taking jobs from Mexico by building our gas pipes there to help make cheap electricity for them. Which is great, they need cheap power, but they're not, they're not fracking their shale to get cheap gas there.
because they don't have the infrastructure for it. Okay, gentlemen, I have one last uh, request from each of you. Um, this is a hypothetical scenario for each of you. Uh, you're advising both the Leader of the Senate as well as also the Speaker of the House, uh, uh, the new Leader of the Senate, should I say, and the, the current Speaker of the House. Uh, you have one minute uh, elevator speech to both of them about what their agenda should be for the next two years, starting with Josh. <laughs> uh, I have a laundry list of clients. I think they should do everything that all of those clients want. But on, uh, uh, but on energy and environment issues, I think they need to be first and foremost on ensure uh, do all the work necessary to minimize the unnecessary costs being imposed on the economy as a result of a variety of regulations that have been promulgated by this administration. That means holding their feet to the fire on the substance and finding opportunities to either improve finalized regulations or delay, postpone, or stop some of the ones that have, that, that, that have been proposed. Mark. I'd have to uh, take the same vote. In fact, that would help. That way we, we, we have consensus advising the, the leaders. The single most important thing for most business leaders that I talk to and work with, small and large, it's not the tax rate. Everybody likes lower taxes. It's not, it's not macro policy. It's regulatory uh, implementation and the potential for new uh, regulations that are onerous. Uh, the change in the regulatory environment in terms of enforcement, if you like, more aggressive enforcement, has been stultifying. The fact that we've had an oil and gas boom despite it is remarkable. I think that would, my, my vote would be, other than don't screw up, <clears throat> which is always a potential when you change the leadership uh, because of distraction, sort of the, the, look, the look squirrel moment that will occur if uh, the other party does something that causes the squirrels to all run, uh, in, in, which is normal politics, is to not, not screw up and focus on the burdens that have been created for the economy is we fix the burdens, which are typically regulatory first, hold back creation of new burdens, we'll get a lot of growth out of that without having to change the fundamental legislation. And I would advise, let's begin the hard work behind the scenes of fundamental transformation, transformational omnibus legislation like the Energy Policy Conservation Act. Let's throw out the old act. We don't need it anymore. Let's do a new comprehensive omnibus bill on what energy policy should look like. That'll take time, but you have to start the spade work behind the scenes now. Bill. I take, a, I guess, a great, a very different view of this. Congress is dysfunctional. <laughs> and like elections have consequences, dysfunction has consequences. And until that's solved, I think there's increasing damage done to the country and the economy. Um, our social moral fabric and so I would urge both of them to get every member to read Henry Clay's statement that politics is not about political philosophy and ideology it's about governing and if you can't compromise you can't govern on that happy note bada boom, bada boom. <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen uh, as the delicate may fly of fate meets with the windshield of time uh, and the angry wasp of destiny flies up the trouser leg of despair. I must bring this erudite conversation to an end. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists uh, for their excellent remarks. Please join me in thanking them.